Good morning. Happy Easter to the Hill Vallejo family. And I especially want to welcome you if this is your first time watching us. Thanks for allowing us to be with you on this very special morning. I think you'll agree with me that without a doubt, this is the most unusual Easter celebration that any of us have ever gone through. Can I get a good amen? I heard you. I heard you. You gave me an amen. I believe you gave me an amen. But it's so weird to be here in this celebration center and to be by myself. There's just, there's chairs, empty chairs all around me. I tell you what, to me and probably to you, Easter's all about the crowds. It's all about the candy. It's all about the kids coming together, people in their new outfits and, and having that celebration. Well, we're going to do the best we can today to celebrate together, but I'm going to tell you something. This coronavirus is going to pass, and we are going to have a great time when we get together week after week after week, like the Bible says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, and we are going to celebrate. We are going to have a kingdom party, and it's something for us all to look forward to. In the meantime, I want you to know that we are praying for you. We're praying for your protection from this disease. And we're praying for your recovery if it's affected you or any of your family members in any way. We're praying Psalm 91 that you would hide safely under the shelter of the Almighty. We're praying for the safety not only of our families and those that are watching, but everyone who is sheltered in place, everyone who is on the front lines, all the health workers, all the doctors and the nurses the first responders and the, the, the police, the fire, the, the EMTs and the paramedics and those that are working in grocery stores and, and, and essential services and delivery men and people that are out there and, and we're just praying for each and every one of you. And don't worry, we haven't forgot about you parents either. I can't imagine what you're going through and the patience that God, just the patience that God is developing in you. And you know, patience is something you can't pray for. You can't say, God, give me patience. patience. It's something you gotta have. It comes in that moment. And so we are praying for you. I, did any of you ever dream Maybe some of you, I guess there's a portion of us that, of you that have uh, felt like someday you might, have been a, you might have been called to be a homeschool teacher, right? But for the most of you, I'm sure like, no, that wasn't, I didn't sign up for that. So you need patience. We are praying for you that God would give um, everything you need. And then we're praying for those who have been furloughed and those that have been laid off and, and facing challenges as this thing drags on and that there would be no complications in you getting your stimulus money or whatever it is that's coming to you that God would just make a way. So know that you are in our prayers this morning. Uh, but I believe that today what I'm going to share with you is going to help you. It has the potential to make sense to where you're at, to make sense to give context to what you're going through, as well as to give us all a hope for the future. I want you to know that God's got this. And more importantly, God's got you. You're right there in the palm of his hand. And he's got you. You're safe and you are secure. Now, I'll bet that as you've been sheltered in place, uh, you probably need something to do like an Easter egg hunt, right? I think another activity wouldn't hurt. So you maybe already have had the Easter egg hunt. But if not, you probably have one planned. I know that Betsy and I, you know, we raised seven children and uh, we had many an Easter egg hunt. Uh, I always kiddingly say that um, we had seven children, but uh, I was an only child. And so she really raised eight children. I was one of them. And one of the things that we did, and she included me in this, is that we did Easter egg hunts every year. And, uh, she, but she was so good at hiding those baskets. And the kids and I would get so frustrated because oftentimes we just couldn't find them. And so sometimes the kids would get a little bit upset and, and, and maybe you know, a little bit mad they couldn't find it. And so I'd just get frustrated and I'd give up. And so what I did is I started, instituted a, trans, uh, a tradition that even continues to today is that um, I'll pay $5 to any one of my kids or grandkids that would find my basket for me. And that took away their frustration and it took away my frustration and it was a win-win situation. 
But whatever you're doing today, I, I just trust that you'll make the best of it, make the most of it um, as we are sheltered here together. You know, being sheltered in place, the scriptures talk about being sheltered in place. And a couple of weeks ago, I put on, on Facebook, I, I reposted something that a friend of mine had put. He said, in, in the scriptures, someone said that in the Old Testament, Passover was the first shelter in the home to avoid death and encouraged everyone that this year celebrate Passover sheltering in place until the COVID-19 angel of death passed over us. Oh, that was a good application. There's another uh, situation in the New Testament where when Jesus was crucified, everyone Every one of his followers went and sheltered in place for fear of the religious leaders and, and the politicians. And then, of course, there was Jesus who sheltered in place for three days in the tomb. Now, Jesus sheltered in place to save us from something that had infected every single one of us. Sin is like a virus that would, that no amount of physical washing or ceremonial sacrifice could take away. And sin was killing all of us. The Bible tells us that the soul that sins shall die. And in the Old Testament, you remember, there were all kinds of rules and regulations trying to clean people from their sins. Ceremonial washings, baptisms, rituals, sacrifices of animals, the shedding of their blood, but nothing was able to cleanse from this virus that affected every human being called sin. Here's what Romans chapter 5, 18 and 19 says. Consequently, just as a result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life to all men. For just as the disobedience of the one man, all were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, many will be made righteous. Sin like the coronavirus started with one person, Adam, and spread to each and every one of us. But through Jesus and his once for all sacrifice, not only died to pay the penalty for our sin, but also rose up to give us new life. So I've been thinking about it. Jesus being sheltered in place, asking myself, what was going on with him during those three days while his body was lying in the tomb? And what was different when he came out on resurrection day? Well, the Bible doesn't offer a whole lot of information regarding what Jesus did during his three days in the tomb. But there is something that I want to share with you from 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19. Here's what it says. Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit, through whom he went and proclaimed. Now, the New King James says he preached to the spirits that were in prison. The Greek word for proclaimed there is heralded a message. So after his body died, I believe he, he, the first thing he did was he ushered the thief that died next to him on the cross because Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. And then he, he went and he took all those that had been sheltered in place. You remember all the righteous that had died before him? All those that were righteous that died under the law? Abraham and, and David and Moses and all those that had been sheltering in place until Jesus uttered the words, it is finished. And he took all of them to paradise. And then I believe he went elsewhere to where these disobedient spirits were sheltered in place in quarantine and he set them straight. He proclaimed a herald. He preached to them. Here's what I think he said. It is finished and so are you. What you knew was coming, your defeat is here. God has put all of his enemies under his feet and made them, made you his footstool. 
including death, his last enemy. In other words, he was telling these spirits that though you may have thought that you had, had won a battle, you have lost the war. You have lost the war. In other words, Jesus was proclaiming truth. He was preaching victory. He preached the power of the cross. And I got to think. And I got to thinking about, so what am I thinking about? As what am I doing during this period of time where I'm sheltered in place? Am I proclaiming that same victory over my enemies? Or am I just simply waiting for the grim reaper to come, the coronavirus to come and just take me away? Am I speaking the truth while I'm sheltered in place like Jesus did, proclaiming his victory through his death and resurrection? Am I proclaiming the healing power of his blood? Or am I just grumbling at the kids and arguing with my spouse? See, what happens is we're trying to fill the time right now while we're sheltered in place. And, and some of us, let's, let's be honest, we're having a tough time with it. We're struggling. I know for me, I'm making one too many, maybe two too many, maybe three too many trips to the refrigerator every day. There's no sports on TV and what are we watching? And some of us are are online way too much, spending too much money with that online shopping. All that is to say is, how about we take our focus off of anything that has been made an idol and let's focus on what God has done and look forward to what he's about to do when this crisis passes. I'm praying today that you would have an encounter with him because guess what? These circumstances are going to change. But he never changes. Your world, he can flip upside right because right now, all our world is upside down. He is our hope. And so I'm asking that you would just right now begin to tune in and hone in and focus on what is, what is it that I'm doing sheltered in place what did Jesus do, his spirit do, sheltered in place? He focused on the power of the cross. He focused on the victory that God had won. And I just think that that's what we need to do. We need to focus on the fact that, that God is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. These circumstances that you and I are going through, though it seems like it's going to last forever, it won't. And when Jesus came out of the tomb... Things were different. Things had changed. And the lives of the people that he encountered, he made different. And so this morning, this Easter, an encounter with Jesus right where you are. You're not, you say, well, I'm not in church. I can't walk the aisle. I can't come to the altar. Yes, you can. You can, you can make that place right where you are. That an encounter with Jesus this morning, focusing on his finished work, what he's done for you and what he will do, and how things are going to be different. Once the shelter in place is lifted, oh, life is going to look differently. And especially if you'll take the time this morning to listen to what God is saying to you and let hope burst forth like Jesus coming out of that tomb. Victory this morning for all of us. Because look, at, I'll give you four quick examples of people that he met once he came out of the tomb and how that encounter changed their life. First of all, he took away fear. Second, he satisfied the doubter. Third, he opened the eyes of, just couldn't, who, of those who couldn't make sense out of their circumstance and he gave them hope. And fourth, he offered restoration to fallen followers. And I gotta believe that, that many of us fall into at least one or maybe more of those categories this morning. So would you just give me these next few moments, undivided attention and let God speak into your heart. See, when Jesus rose, he met with the disciples. They were sheltered in place. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. They were sheltered in place. They were hiding. They'd all run away and they were hiding because they didn't know what was going to happen to them. The, the religious leaders were after them. The political leaders were after them. 
And yet in John chapter 20, and I urge you just to look at John chapter 20. There in verse 21, it says he came to them on that day of his resurrection. And he walked into that room and they were so afraid. And he offered them peace. He says in verse 21, peace be with you. Can you just take a deep breath right now and, and understand that, that Jesus is as close as that breath that you're taking? And just be at peace. I know there's so much going on. I took, I took extra time this morning to being in the message to, to enumerate all the things that I could of what you might be going through, all the challenges. And yet right now, take that breath. Breathe in God's spirit. Peace be with you. Oh, the hope that burst forth when they recognized it was Jesus. He's risen. But there was one that was missing that day. We all know the story. The poor guy, poor Thomas. Poor Thomas. Every year the preacher gets up and talks about doubting Thomas, but he was. He doubted. He wasn't there with them. And, and, and after Jesus had departed for a time, he came to meet with them and they said, Thomas, the Lord's alive. And he goes, unless I put my fingers in his nail-scarred hands and unless I touch the wound in his side, I, I'm, I'm just not going to believe. He was a doubter. But Jesus, a week later, comes and you know the story, I hope, that in John 20, 26 through 29, Jesus, so gracious, so gracious, says to Thomas, go ahead, go ahead, touch these wounds, feel my side. And immediately it says, the doubt was removed. Thomas had an encounter with Jesus. And he uttered these words, my Lord and my God. And now Jesus said something that I think was written for our encouragement. He says there um, in verse 29, he says, because you have seen me, you believed. And that's good. But this is the word for us. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. You know, in this series on miracles that we've been doing, um, John kind of wraps it up by saying in verse 30, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of the disciples, and they are written that you might believe. In other words, just hearing about it, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, that just even hearing about these miracles, God can breathe life, hope. Faith can rise up. You can be an overcomer simply by hearing stories like Thomas. But Jesus wasn't finished because he also took time to be with two men on the road, the, called the road to Emmaus. It's, a road that leads the road, it's on the road that leads toward the Mediterranean Sea as you're leaving Jerusalem, heading west. But these two on the road to Emmaus, when they Listen to Jesus, they listened to him all day and then when they broke bread, when they broke bread with him like we do with communion, it said something like th that, that was just like a, like a scale, if you will, on their eye or a, a blinder was lifted. And again, this encounter with the living Christ changed everything and they, they changed, they literally repented, they changed their direction, they turned around and they ran back to Jerusalem their upside down world had been made upside right. And they ran back to be with the others and share what had happened to them. Their lives had been changed. Hope had been born. But then Jesus still wasn't finished. He was here for 40 days before he ascended and there was a time then that he goes to Galilee and he finds Peter who had fallen away. And there we see how Jesus restored fallen followers. Remember, they were out fishing and Jesus said, have, have you caught anything? No, you, you know the scenario. And they recognized he was the Lord and Jesus there waiting 
to have breakfast with them on the shore, restoring these fallen followers. And maybe you fall into that category, land in that category. Maybe you've, through this situation have fallen away you've lost your job and doubt has overtaken you and 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 you just kind of have given up you know what God understands there's something that I've come to, to realize over the years is that you just can't run away from God you think no matter how far you've gone the moment you turn around you'll discover that he's been standing there the whole time he's there to welcome you back today he doesn't condemn you if anything, he, he understands. He understands that we can become so enveloped in our, in our circumstances and we can only see with, with the eyes, that the physical eyes and understand. But he asks us to let him come and through an encounter with him today, restore that relationship. Remove your doubt. Calm your fears. I'm gonna ask you this morning, that you would join me in a prayer because there's a future coming. The present is gonna give way to the future. And the future that God has for you, the Bible says that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no one has even comprehended what God has planned. No one certainly understood what we've just gone through. But look, God can do anything. God is the one who can change things on a dime. And so we're gonna pray today, we're gonna believe we're gonna believe that once this shelter in place, that like Jesus coming out of that tomb in new life, I tell you what, I believe there's gonna be a revival, a reviving of people. It's gonna be wonderful. It can be wonderful and it can start today. Before our worship team comes with one song, it's called a miracle. It's just gonna, it's gonna really just wrap all this and seal it all up. But would you just pray with me for just a moment? I'm gonna ask you to bow your head. Let's pray. God, we just... We just ask now for those that are just so feeling so cooped up and, and restricted, God, that you would just breathe your peace on them right now, that we would focus on your victory, that we would understand that when you said it is finished, God, you put all enemies under your feet. So whatever is an enemy of any one of your people today, we put it under your feet and we proclaim the victory of Jesus through his death over sin that brought us victory over sin also bringing us new life. God, that today you would just elevate us to a new level, that you would bring peace, you'd bring hope, the doubts would, would melt away. God, that we would just see you, that we would, with the eyes of faith, understand that you're the God of yesterday, the God of today. And you're the God that's waiting for us in a future that we believe is bright, full of hope and full of life. You are the resurrection and the life. And so this morning, God, I pray. And we come against every fear and worry and doubt. We ask for God just this time to pass quickly. Lord, that through this encounter this morning with you, Lord, that we would just, we would have an energy that we've never possessed before as your spirit takes preeminence and prominence in our life. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for what you have done. We thank you for who you are and for your grace that abounds in all of us who receive you. This morning where you are, before we end this prayer, if you would like to give the Lord your life, Give it back to him. He's already died for you, so what you do is you give it back to him. You say, Lord, I give you my life. Do it right now. Lord, I give you my life. Give me a fresh start, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.